Well, I don't know if uh, you have ever heard of a saying, uh, find out what fascinates you and use that passion in your work and in life. For me, biology is absolutely fascinating. Uh, in my line of work as a university professor, biology is what I do in both teaching and research every day. In a macro sense, biology is about life and death, propagation and adaptation. A new generation coming after the old, going forward in time, like the sunrise and the sunset. In this life's journey, I have traversed a good length of the road, and I have many fond memories of my early childhood days, of the time that I spent in Singapore as a middle school student, and the many, many good friends that I made during college in Hong Kong before coming to the United States as a 21-year-old and landed in New York City. My mother was my role model and my real life uh, teacher. She was a loving, vibrant, and independent woman. Even well into her 90s, she lived independently in a single family house, drove herself around town in her trusty old Mercedes, putting out new plantings in the spring, and raked the leaves okay, in her yard in the fall. Indeed, she passed away from a cardiovascular incident while raking leaves almost exactly nine years ago. Sometime before her passing, I asked her, how do you manage to do all these things at your age? Well, her answer was, if you take care of yourself, and if you're lucky, you can do that as well. So this is a graph, okay, uh, uh, from the UN population uh, uh, division, okay, that looks at two parameters, okay. The bars in red, okay, is a measurement of expected life, uh, life expectancy over time, okay, of about 80 year period from 1950 to 2030. Now, of course, this increase in life expectancy is largely due to better awareness of the population and better health care. Also presented in this graph, in green, okay, is the fertility rate of women in the United States. Now, what you see is that it dropped significantly in the 1960s and the 1970s, and that is because more women went into the workforce. And it basically stays flat, okay, at around one and a half to two children per woman uh, going forward. So the combination of these two trends, okay, is such that over the next 15 years or so, okay, the number of older adults of 65 plus is going to make up a bigger slice, okay, of the U.S. population than the youngsters, okay, under the age of 18. Indeed, okay, if you look at the data, okay, over a 150-year period, let's say from 1900 to 2050, you come to realize that both the absolute number as well as the percentage of the 65 plus population, the growth is indeed impressive. Thanks to the advancement that is made in pharmaceutical and medical fields, we are living well, and the majority of us will enjoy a long and healthy life. The result of this is that the makeup of a population is changing from that of a pyramid, okay, with a large base of the young at the bottom, okay, and a small apex of the O at the top, okay? And it is moved from the pyramid, okay, to that of a pillar or a column, whereby the distribution, okay, is more or less even across the ages. Now, this has significant implication in many aspects of our society, okay? You can think immediately of, for those of us that is in the US, of social security, okay? Uh, social security trust funds, okay? And just as importantly, okay, it is the burden, okay, of a class of disease that's called neurodegenerative disease, okay, will have on our society. Why do I say this? Okay, simply put, okay, age, okay, is the well-known primary risk factor for the development of neurodegenerative disease. 
The most common form of neurodegenerative disease is what is called Alzheimer's disease, okay? And currently affects, okay, uh, one in 10 individuals over the age of 65 years old. Parkinson, okay, also a neurodegenerative disease, comes in second, okay? There is no effective therapeutics to treat or halt either Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, or other forms of neurodegenerative disease. And these diseases progress with an irreversible downward trajectory, and they're associated with huge socioeconomic as well as personal costs. So neurodegeneration affects our brain, okay? And the human brain is absolutely an amazing organ capable of surprising feats of creativity and discovery. And it's from this organ of about three pounds in weight, okay, with about 100 billion, okay, of nerve cell that comes the creativity and innovation that made our internet, our phone, our car, and all the other inventions possible. These highly specialized nerve cells that you see on the lower bottom uh, of your screen, okay, uh, looks like no other cell type in, uh, in our body, okay. Uh, they send out many, many different projections. Okay, these projections allow them to make contact with neighboring nerve cells to receive information and to transmit information. And it is from this, okay, uh, neural network of nerve cell activity, okay, that make possible our movements, such as what I'm doing right now, our thoughts, okay, uh, and our emotion. Now, on the other side of this brilliance, okay, uh, uh, of our brain, okay, is the vulnerability or exquisite sensitivity of our nerve cell to damages, okay. For example, as a result of a mild concussion, okay, or due to aging, okay. Now, you often hear older adults say, oh, I forgot where I put my key. Well, this is a normal part of aging, okay, because your brain's ability to store and retrieve information, okay, goes down, okay, uh, over time. In the case of neurodegenerative disease, however, okay, and they're known as age-dependent or age-related neurodegenerative disease, the diminished capacity of the mind is rapid, astounding, and irreversible. This is terrifying. The big question in front of the scientific and medical community is R, okay? What, how, and why? What is causing the neurons to die off? How and why do they die? Currently, we don't have an answer to these questions, okay? Uh, scientists have known for some time, okay, that there are common features in neurodegenerative disease, okay? Neuron death, number one, okay? Brain shrinkage, number two, and just as importantly, the presence of protein aggregates in the brain of subjects that died of neurodegenerative disease. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, this is what is termed amyloid plaque or senile plaque, okay. In Parkinson's disease, okay, it is what is termed Lewy body. So for a very long time, the collective thinking of the scientific community is that it must be this clumped up non-native protein that is the culprit that are killing the neurons to drive the pathology in neurodegeneration. Well, I just used the word non-native, and some of you may wonder, okay, what that means. To give you an analogy, you have a chicken egg. You cracked it open, and you see flowy egg yolk and egg white. The, the proteins are in the native form. Had the egg remained whole, and if the conditions are right, a chick will emerge from this egg in due time. However, if you put this egg in a pot of boiling water, both the yolk and the egg, uh, and the egg white will congeal into solid, and no chick will ever emerge from this boiled egg because all the proteins are non-native or denatured, and they no longer work. So to get back to neurodegeneration, there are many, many, in fact, way too many clinical trials, okay, measured in the order of about hundreds to thousands, okay, depending on how you count them, okay. There are way too many clinical trials, and the primary goal of these trials, okay, is to remove the clumped up, okay, non-native protein aggregates in hopes they can reverse or halt the process of neurodegeneration. None of these trials has worked out. 
And scientists and clinicians often said, okay, well, we're 20 years too late, okay, in treatment, okay, to account for this uh, collective failure. In the midst of all this suffering, in spite of the tremendous resources that have been poured into it, scientists began to think that perhaps it is not the highly aggregated form of the disease protein that is visible under an optical microscope that is actually killing, killing the neuron. Rather, it might just be that the lower molecular form of the protein, okay, before they become aggregated into clumps, okay, that may be uh, what is driving the pathology. Now, this is a very important concept because you absolutely need to ascertain the form of the disease protein that is causing problem early on in the disease process before you can think about how to develop effective strategies to stop, to mitigate, and to prevent uh, disease progression. Now, where do I, as a researcher, come into the, uh, come into this story? In biology, there's a slogan, function follows form. I have had a long-standing interest in studying how the many different proteins in our cell can keep the structure for function over time, and particularly in aging. And because neurodegeneration is associated with changes in the structural dynamics of the disease protein, I figured that I can put to use some of the things that I have learned, and perhaps in so doing, make a small dent in this impenetrable wall of neurodegeneration. Well, I elect to focus my efforts on Huntington disease for two reasons, okay. First and foremost, Huntington disease is what is known as a monogenic disease, single gene determinant, with an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. Now, in simple layman's term, what it means is that a single dominant mutant Huntington gene that controls the Huntington disease, okay, trait. And offsprings, okay, will have a 50% chance of inheriting this disease from a parent that carries the mutation. For Alzheimer's disease, as well as Parkinson's disease, even though they're more common, the issue is that they're multi-genetic determinants, as well as environmental factors that can combine to contribute uh, to cause the disease. So uh, in other words, okay, Huntington disease is a simpler black box, okay? And re research, and oftentimes, especially at the beginning, what you want to do is to use a simpler system because it allows you to tease out the cause and effect relationship much easier. Second reason is that I had a friend and a dear colleague, a brilliant biophysicist who was my next door lab neighbor while I was at Harvard Medical School, who tragically passed away from Huntington disease. Uh, and the, the thing is, okay, uh, that such a brilliant mind can succumb to such a terrible disease that is entirely beyond his control and died, okay, in his prime of life had a definite impact in my choice, okay, uh, as a, uh, a research scientist. So, uh, for, the, for these two reasons that I just explained, okay, we started work, okay, on trying to figure out what is causing Huntington disease and why is it that specific neurons are dying off, okay, in hunting the disease subjects, okay. So we try to figure out, okay, some of the conditions, okay, that would change the dynamics of the Huntington protein, okay. Uh, we use a cell model for this work, okay. The uh, necessity and the advantage of a cell model is the following, and that is it basically compacts, okay, the timeline of disease progression in a Huntington, uh, a Huntington subject from the time of birth to disease onset of about 40 years, okay, and condense it, okay, into days, okay, in a laboratory dish, okay, in order for us to do the experiment, okay. So this is a composite image, okay, of some of the cells that we have looked at and analyzed, okay. Uh, these and other results have been published, okay. Uh, well, you're looking at some very colorful cells, okay. And some of you may ask, well, do cells really look like this? Okay, the answer is no. Uh, but for scientists like myself, okay, who need to track the comings and goings of proteins, okay, we put a color tag on them. So um, in this case, the green color that you're looking at, okay, represents the Huntington protein. 
the normal Huntington protein, okay, the two panels on your left, okay, and the mutant Huntington protein, the three sets of images, okay, uh, on the right. Now, the red color, okay, uh, stands for a protein that is called the chaperone, okay, that helps other proteins to fold. And the blue uh, color, okay, uh, marks the cell nucleus. Now, the result from these very colorful cell images tell us that the mutant Huntington protein, as well as the normal Huntington protein, normally is present all over the cell, okay, in a format that we call diffuse, okay. Under certain condition, uh, perhaps with the help of the chaperone protein, okay, the mutant Huntington protein and only the mutant Huntington protein will pack together, okay, to form this very, very bright aggregate uh, that we call inclusion body. Uh, this result is highly, highly reproducible, okay, and gave us a handle to begin answering some of the questions of which of these forms of the Huntington protein may be pathogenic, okay, and also begin to tease out the uh, answer to the question of why that might be the case. And this work continues. Now, while I'm deeply involved in this work, okay, uh, I cannot possibly expect, okay, to make significant progress by myself. My time, my energy, and my resources are limited. Nonetheless, the fact that I'm also a teacher and a mentor to my students gives me hope. A number of them have contributed to this work and a co-authors uh, uh, of our publication. In thinking of my role as a teacher and a mentor, okay, and as part of the uh, preparation for this TEDx conversation, I ask myself, what does it take uh, to be a good teacher and a mentor? Now, if you sit in front of a computer and you search, you come up with many adjectives, okay, uh, knowledgeable, resilient, okay, and so on and so forth. And are any of these an apt description of myself, okay, in my job, okay, uh, perhaps not. The only thing, okay, that I'm uh, certain of is my commitment to the teaching and training of my students, okay. Doing this with the best uh, uh, of my capabilities. The process of teaching, nurturing, and mentoring of our young ones, our students, okay, and our next generation of societal contributors and builders is like that of a relay. It starts out with a kindergarten and elementary school teacher, going forward to our middle school and high school teacher, and further on to our college and postgraduate professors, okay, and research advisors. Growing up, I never thought that it would follow in my mother's footsteps into becoming a teacher. In retrospect, her teaching and nurturing of me made this career's choice preordained. I am a small cog in this academic incubator in the hopes that my effort will make a difference in rewriting the future of neurodegeneration through research, instruction, and mentoring. Lastly, I want to give a shout out to all the dedicated teachers that are out there, and thank you.